Hey, stackers, let's kick off today's show with a salute to our troops. Whether you're listening to this abroad or on the home front, thank you so much for helping keep us all safe. And thanks also to Navy Federal for not only supporting our troops, but who support our troops who are not only defending us, but hoping to stack a few Benjamins of their own. Let's get this show going. Hey, I'm Mr. Wow. And I'm Mrs. Wow from Waffles on Wednesday. And when we're not eating waffles, we're stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and are you ready to get back to traveling? How about traveling for less but having even better experiences? If you answered yes, yes, and oh, hell yes, then today's show is for you. Today, we welcome the host of PBS's Travel Scope, Joseph Rosendo. Plus, according to recent data, the Roth IRA and 401k are the single fastest growing type of tax shelter. Is this the right move for your money? We'll discuss this and more during our headline segment. And to bring things on home, we'll toss out the Haven Lifeline to Steve the Mailman, who is quite the funny guy. And I'll take you for a ride with some of my theme park trivia. And now, two guys who are flying standby on this podcast, it's Joe and oh, j j j j g Well, as we're in the waiting area, waiting for our plane to take off, we might as well make some fun for you. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday. I'm Joe Sell. See how I average Joe money on Twitter. And uh, the guy next to me here in the loading area, in the loading zone for this podcast, it's Mr. OG. If you think I fly, stand by. <laughs> boy, oh boy. Private, yo. That's how we That's how we do it now. Yeah, not not even middle seat. No. Front left. That's where I sit. Yes. Are you now for the rest of time going to knock on the door? You know how you go into the plane when you- Hey, guys. Yeah, when you fly Delta and you take a right, you're just going to stop and wave. Hey, good to see you. I've flown one of these. A little bit smaller, but flown one of these too. A little smaller. (laughs) Just a tad. How many propellers does yours have? Mine has one on the front. It goes- It's really loud. I didn't see any of your propellers. I'm so excited about today's show. We are talking travel today. We're all getting excited about getting back into the travel game. Hopefully at some point in 2021, Joseph Rosendo, two-time Emmy award-winning Joseph Rosendo coming on. He, uh, by the way, his Emmys in the lifestyle area. I noticed there's a lot of cooking shows that have won. Uh, Last year, Mr. Mike Rowe won the Emmy, but Joseph Rosendo has won it twice. We got a great show, but of course, first, we got a couple of great headlines, so let's move. Hello, darlings. And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins headlines. I love it, OG, when we get these headlines that come from a place where they normally don't. This this one's from thesouthafrican.com. I'm sure a newspaper you read regularly. Sadly, it's not on the list. Lauren Philpott wrote this piece. I'm wondering if this is coming to the U.S. Lauren writes, tourism and hospitality industry braces for fresh battle insurance payouts. Businesses that have business interruption coverage are saying insurers, this is a shock, are not coming to the party with regard to their contractual obligations as laid out in these policies. Tourism and hospitality providers again face economic hardship with the slump in demand brought on by extended lockdown restrictions. Revised restrictions have resulted in reduced opportunities for hotel and tourism provided to operate. Many businesses with business interruption cover have battled for months to force insurers to honor their contractual obligations. The insurers say, though, that the government imposed lockdown and not COVID caused the losses incurred by many businesses. And because of that, they don't have to pay. So insurance companies are being slimy. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Yeah. Just like banks. Banks and insurance companies. Necessary evil. Do you think we're going to see this in the United States? Insurance companies start to go, uh, hey, 
listen, that business interruption insurance, you, yeah, I, d- I don't think, uh, sorry. I think it already has been. I think, uh, I'm certain that I've read stories about small businesses that have had that and uh, not been able to collect on it. It's sad because this is the exact type of thing, in my view, that the insurance agent tells you it will protect against. You know, we have oh, yeah. some pandemic or calam- calamity that will shut down your business. Boom, you get 10 grand a month to keep the doors open. And then you got to sue your insurance company to get paid, which means that'll go against anything you make. And a lot of companies, small businesses, especially OG, can't afford to sue the insurance company. Yeah, super frustrating. And uh, I had an issue with a property that we own, and it was on an outbuilding on the property. So we had this commercial liability insurance, we had this commercial insurance policy that covered all sorts of stuff. Then this thing happened, and I called and I said, hey, let's go uh, take a peek at it. Let me know what you think. They're like, right away. Obviously, they're like, oh, sorry. Yeah, we can't cover that. I said, I'm going to need a little bit more information than sorry are bad. They said, yeah, that uh, that roof over there, that was too that, that roof was too bad to insure, so we didn't insure the roof. You're kidding said, me. Did it say it in the actual policy? <laughs> no, of course not. I'm like, it doesn't say that anywhere. They're like, well, it was supposed to, so... We're going to put it in now. And I'm like, you can. It's perfectly fine to put it in now. But we're going to adjust the premium associated with it. Also, we're going to need to cover the loss event from the thing that just happened. That you actually covered. Yeah. And And, uh, did they cover it? uh, It is sadly still in litigation. Pending. Yes, pending. Still pending. So I have to take a little sidebar for a quick second. Um, Down here in the basement, just like uh, most basements, you have like a little window right? That you can see out of, but most people don't know that you can see out of it. So you, so you, you know, you're kind of seeing up, up sure. to, toward the street, yes. you know, just trying to picture. I, I know what you're, I know, I know you know what it looks like. You're sitting right next to me. I'm painting the picture for the audience. The you telling me this? So right outside the front door is a bus stop at mom's house here. And I'm watching a 14 year old ish kid pick off all the bark of the tree in the front yard. And I'm kind of wondering, he's just waiting for the bus. And I'm just kind of curious if we should go tell him to stop doing it. You're killing the tree. Ah, this is hurting me. You know, or like put a speaker out there next time. So when he does it, then we can be like, <laughs> just be like, this hurts when you rip off my flesh in the middle of winter. <laughs> I'm naked. Oh, that'd be funny. That'd be so good. That reminds me of a story. I'm going to tell a story later. All right. Maybe. Well, back to this. This is why you want to look at the rating of the insurance company. I know that everybody, when it comes to insurance, what's the first thing you do? Oh, gee, you go and you compare premiums, right? Price. Compare the price. But why do you have insurance in the first place? So that it pays. So you want to look at claims experience for the company. Uh That's the necessary thing. Are they going to pay out when it comes time? Where do we find that information? Oh, good luck. Uh, Well, every state uh, legislature has to, or every state insurance company that regulates insurances uh, and insurance agencies and insurance companies in their state uh, require documentation to be uh, put together like that. You can Google it, the rating, you know, you're talking about the uh, claims paying ability, uh, uh, Moody's or S&P will rate the insurance company sometimes. But a lot of it it ends up being just a personal experience and who you end up with as a claims adjuster, you know? Sometimes you get somebody that wants to help and sometimes you don't. It's it's mesmerizing to me how random that event actually is. It's so frustrating reading this piece. One of the big South African insurers has actually paid out three months of losses. And it seems like that that says we are culpable to some degree. Hey, we're going to give you three months. Legal battles are forcing insurance companies to meet the obligation. Looks like people are winning. Just reading down through this. I'll link to it in our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. It isn't about just the price. It's about what you get. The second headline comes to us from Napa-Net. That's the National Association of Plan Advisors. Here's a good question for you that Ted Godbout writes in this piece, OG. Will all roads lead to Roth? He says, whether in the form of an IRA or 401k, certain aligning factors suggest the prospect for gains in the Roth market are strong, according to a recent report. And by the way, by gains, let's be clear about who this site is for. It's for providers, meaning 
if you offer Roths in your plan, people are going to use it and people are going to use it more and more. Uh, in the Cerule Edge U.S. Retirement Edition fourth quarter of 2020 looks at retirement trends for 2021. The firm observes the demographic factors, the increasing prevalence of Roth and defined contribution plans and potential tax changes that fuel a bullish outlook for Roth IRAs. You like a Roth. Tax-free forever. Hard to argue. Pay the bill now. Don't worry about it ever again. Especially if you think that tax rates are going to rise. Hard to see them not going up for certain segments of the income brackets for sure. But if you see if you see us as the same, if you see tax tax uh, brackets staying the same even and you're on the youngish side, you're many years away from that date that you're going to pull the money out, it still makes sense at the same number. Yeah. And I think there's the other side of it too, which is a little bit of the human nature, human behavior thing. Because when you look in your 401k or you look in your IRA and it's a million dollar balance, but it's taxable million, that's a whole different dollar amount than a tax-free $1 million account. Yeah. I think it'll provide a little bit more accuracy and sensation that you're feeling, you know, because you're like, Oh, I knew I had to get to 2 million to get my, you know, that's the number. Well, it's not two. You got to get to, you got to get to three because you got to give a third of that back to the tax person. So you like the Roth from a behavioral perspective from a, even that, Hey, yeah. I got it. I mean, this is all my money. It's all yours. Now I can just put it in long-term uh, options and short-term out of the money puts. Please lose every cent Somebody, of it. Somebody's got to do it. Take it down to Vegas. Put it all on red. Well, here's, here's the question. When we look long-term at the Roth, one thing I know people have talked about for ages is you look at the amount of debt that the government has. And certainly with the last two relief packages, the United States have had, they're not doing the debt any favor there. What's the chance that the government says, hey, we got no choice. We got to take back part of this Roth thing. Well, there's always that chance, right? The thing is, is I don't know that they would retroactively change it. If they decided to change it moving forward and said, okay, everybody after this date, you know, here's the new tax rules. I don't know that they can go back or would go back in time and um, retroactively change the tax implications of it. That would be pretty tough. Although, you know, it's the government. They tend to do weird things from time to time. Yeah. Don't, don't wait on the government to do you any favors. We got a couple good takeaways, I think, today, OG. But before that, if you're an active duty service member, veteran, DOD, civilian, or military family member, you can join Navy Federal. That means if you served in any branch of the military, you can join Navy Federal Credit Union. On average, Navy Federal members, listen to this, OG, earn and save 3611 more per year. Pay no fees, get low rates and rate discounts, plus earn cash back and grow your savings. Large credit card balance after the holidays? Let Navy Federal Credit Union help you rebalance your priorities, make a plan to do away with your high interest credit card debt, and transfer your balance to a Navy Federal credit card. With a low intro APR and no balance transfer fees, you can pick the right card to help you in your strategy to take back control. Visit NavyFederal.org. Navy Federal Credit Union, our members are the mission. Insured by NCUA, dollar value of Navy Federal's 2019 member give back study, 25.9-9 to 18% variable APRs based on product type and credit worthiness, up to $1 cash advance transaction fee at non-Navy Federal ATMs. Takeaway number one, I think if you've got a Roth available in your 401k plan and you're not using it, what's the difference between the Roth 401k and the Roth IRA OG tax-wise? Nothing. Same Z, same Zs. If I work at the company, I can still take it out early. My principal, five years in. Well, that's going to be dependent on the plan documents, which... So it's not the same. I thought you meant from a tax standpoint. Well, the tax stamp. Okay. I mean, I'm assuming that nobody's taking their, using their Roths as like just a Are you kidding shell me? trading account. Really? Well, people do it to their IRAs too. It doesn't make it right. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't make it right. You just sent me this piece from the penny hoarder about some dude uh, stopping to put contributions into his 401k so he could go trade some petty stocks. That's because he wasn't working anymore. Well, he is working. He's working hard at making a living at uh, penny stock trading. Doubling down on January 2022s. 
Uh, it's silly, isn't it? I think that's our first uh, takeaway. Second takeaway is when buying insurance, it's not just about the price. You want to have a competitive price, but you also want to make sure that the company has a history of paying claims because someday if you need it, that's why you bought it in the first place. I'm super happy that uh, we're being joined by this fellow Emmy award-winning director and host Joseph Rosendo. He's been a travel food and wine journalist. What a tough job that is OG travel food and wine journalist. Oh, Joseph, I feel so bad for you. I know having to do that for 40 years since 2007, he's hosted, directed and written Joseph Rosendo's travel scope. And if you haven't seen it, I think you're going to love it. Uh, I certainly have loved this show for a long time. Uh, he closes every show, by the way, with this cool Mark Twain quote, travels fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow mindedness. And I love that. I feel like the more I travel and I learn about the world, the more I learn about life. And certainly many of us want to get back to traveling, but we might be rusty on travel deals getting the most out of our money when we travel, getting the most out of life when we travel. How are we going to do it? Well, if you're in the middle of travel planning like we are, uh, this is just in time. Let's say hello to Mr. Joseph Rosendo. And on my dad's shortwave radio, I'm so glad we have him here with us. Joseph Rosendo joins us. How are you? How are you doing, Joe? Great to be on your show. Well, and I'm wondering, a guy like you who's always out and about traveling with COVID, do you, have you just spent the last uh, several months just shaking, hoping to somehow get you and Julie back out of the house? Oh, well, it's, it's been a very frustrating time, of course, but, you know, a lot of people have gone through a lot worse. Uh, all we've been doing is making uh, a number of different plans to be uh, different on shoots or in Europe and having to cancel them every time as it gets closer and closer. We have, uh, for instance, we have arrangements to go to France in April, but we're crossing our fingers that's going to happen. Maybe not. But in any case... Yeah, it's been a very frustrating thing, but we've been, you know, but the pandemic has given me the time to do things I've always wanted to do. And one of them was write the book Musings, The Short Happy Pursuit of Pleasure and Other Journeys. And that was a, a group of stories that I wanted to collect and some new stories from uh, our magazine, our online magazine. It was originally a printed magazine that I did for years and years. So, so it did give me the opportunity to do that. I've been trying to do it for 20 years. And it's funny how things work out, but this was the time. Well, you've done three different things. I mean, you've done all different types of media. You had the radio show for a long time. Of course, you have the award-winning show now. You also have written a lot. What's your favorite of those three? Well, I was an actor for a long time, you know, for 14 years and while I was doing other things, but I was an actor. And so being able to interact with people and talk to people and to be in a presentation type of a mode, um, that's very important to me. And I think that that comes from the many, many years I was an actor. So I think that doing the television show is, is kind of the epitome of that. My travel experiences were always that. On my travel experiences, I was always on. And the stories reflected that, the written stories, the travel stories I did for many years. Uh, But the radio show was my first opportunity to really get in there and create some kind of little theater. And many of the shows were audio documentary shows with sound and my interactions with people and interviews. So I got to kind of get rid of some of that frustrated actor. uh, (laughs) And And then the television show, uh, I think it was like something I was called to do because, um, you know, I I started doing it while I was doing the radio show. We would be doing these little videos that I hope someday would become a television show, which was very an interesting experience. So during that period of time, I was able to use those talents that I had trained for and spent so much money for when I was younger. So it was great to be able to actually use those talents and to and to interact with people. But that's always kind of been my interest. So, yeah, I would think that the television show the is TV. Too- yeah, it's the but writing is a whole different experience, as I'm sure you know. And so uh, it's nice to be able to have those different kinds of uh, 
ways of expressing yourself. Well, I just, and I, and I like the whimsical way you write. It feels like a friend just talking in my ear, by the way, and taking me with you, which is of course for a travel writer is exactly, I'm sure what you're looking for. And in just a second, by the way, on the note of playing clips and having clips, we're going to do that same thing. We're going to take a page from your book. I'd like to play a clip from season 11. It just kind of outlines a few of the things you did. Of course, you're in season 12 now with the show. Uh, But before we do that, in these clips that, that we're about to hear, uh, and, and, and when we watch the Travel Scope show, if you can give us just a look behind the camera for a second, Joseph, yeah. these always look like, you know, there's just somebody with a camera just kind of casually following you around. But I, but I have to imagine setting up these shots is not that easy. How long does it take you to set up the shot, get everything down with the people you're around? The first clip we're going to hear is uh, you on a lobster boat, as an example. Uh, how much preparation goes into each one of these clips? Well, you know, um, there's only four of us in our travel scope crew and a cameraman, a sound man, my wife, who Julie, who is the producer and myself, I write, direct and uh, host it as well. The spontaneity of it is a lot of what the show is about because it's kind of what happens in the travel experience. And that's kind of what we're trying to recreate. So there's not a lot of setup for that. We do, of course, have to figure out what is happening and and how how we're going to shoot it so that so every, everything can be done but there's a lot that happens while we're we're moving uh while it's while it's taking place and so um the setup shots that I think to take the longest are Actually, what takes the longest is doing things and repeating things, is doing things over and over and over again. It's mostly my stand-ups that you see, my presentations, my setups, my walking and talking kind of experiences. Those are the ones that take the longest to get right. The the interactions you see with people, a lot of what we've done ends up on the cutting room floor. So you're seeing the best out of those interactions. And so the work comes in post. But in the moment, we are, I'm in the moment talking to people and and things are happening and the camera is moving around me and trying to catch the interactions between us. And there are, of course, a lot of things we have to stop. Okay, let's, let's, reach into the bucket and grab that lobster. Let's do that as a close-up. So that's a different cutaway shot. But the general instruction I give to my cinematographers, you're needing to be moving. You need to be fluid. You need to be catching everything as it's happened. And you need to be getting all of us involved in this interaction together. Let's listen to this clip. We're going to start off on a uh, lobster boat. And then we will be in a series of locks in Canada. And then after that, we're going to be up on a cliff somewhere. And I can't wait to ask you about that. Here is uh, just a little bit of travel scope. Continue to go. How long has this trap been down there now? Three days. Three days? Yeah. Oh, you should have a lot of lobsters then. Maybe. I can get this one. Ah, 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 he got me. <laughs> oh, look at this. This is a female with eggs. Yes, it is. Now, this one doesn't have any kind of V on it. They have to V it. So for the next three years, this female is going to be producing eggs and restocking the lobster fishery. So we'll send her back to do her job. Thank you so much. Thank you for letting me lost her with you. I hope I helped a little bit. You did. <laughs> you kind of stand in the middle here and try not to... Lose the boat. <laughs> I'm gonna keep the boat, because what happens is when they open the doors, it becomes like a tide that's coming against you. It moves the bus. Can you imagine if they had four or five boats in here? You got to really keep your boat close to the wall. Otherwise, you're gonna be hitting other boats, and they don't want you to do that. And now, if you really wanna have a feeling of what a 2,500 foot drop looks like, it feels like, come with me. Yeah, I don't know that I want to know, Joseph, (laughs) but then I look down on the video here and I get vertigo immediately. Where where are you there? We are in the Taroko Gorge in Taiwan. Taiwan's an amazing island as for an amazing destination for travelers. There's so many things that are part of that experience. The Taroko Gorge is their Grand Canyon is how they like to describe it. And much of Taiwan is mountainous. So this is one of the highest parts of the of the island and the walls the stone is marble for instance it's a it's it's an amazing experience and we were on a hike one of the many hikes that you can take in the area 
it's a hike that takes you right along the edge of this uh, cliff with a 2,500 foot drop right next to you. <laughs> My cameraman, there's a funny thing later in the show where uh, we shoot him going, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm doing this. I can't <laughs> this is really scary. I, yeah. I'm watching it on video and I'm thinking that same thing. Yeah, he's shooting himself in it. It's at the end. It's in the uh, credits in the end of the show. That was an incredible experience. And Taiwan is that. I highly recommend it for travelers. And actually, they've done a pretty good job with the uh, pandemic. Excellent job, actually. There not have many cases but they've made it very difficult for people from the United States to travel there. That's why we haven't done our next show. We have a show scheduled to do in Taiwan. I want to ask you about these other two, but going sure. to Musings, your book, a few of the things that you write about that yeah. have to do with going to places like here in Taiwan. Right. I would think a guy like you is a fantastic packer, like you're great at packing for travel. But you say it muses that packing has always been your enemy, Joseph. Yeah, it is because... It goes to one. It goes. It also is illustrated in one of the other stories. The story El Dorado. I don't know if you remember that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. You know, my wife says I have a MoMA, uh, a fear of missing out. FOMA. What is it, sweetie? FOMA. FOMA. Excuse me. <laughs> my wife says I have FOMA, which is a fear of missing out, and that's true. I'm difficult for me to make decisions on what is the best, what is the best to do, what is the best to take. And so packing becomes a problem when I'm thinking, well, am I going to need this? And uh, which is the best way to satisfy that need? So I did develop a, a early days. That, that story goes back to my days of travel writing. I developed a, a basically an outfit, a costume, a uniform that I could wear on my trips. So I knew I had this coat, these pair of pants, this shirt, and I wouldn't have to think. Would you but recommend I, that, though, for travelers just in I general, would, like would. adopt a thing and then you don't have to worry about it so much? I would. I would say, well, what do you feel comfortable in and have uh, examples of that? And it's particularly if you're a frequent traveler. You know, I, I knew a woman in Great Britain who had her suitcase packed sitting upstairs. She took it out. She washed all the clothes. She put everything back in when she was ready to go. She grabbed that suitcase and walked out. I mean, that may be extreme, but uh Certainly people need to be organized so that they don't add the panic of packing to the experience of traveling, because there is a lot of planning that has to go into really good traveling, I believe. And uh, you don't want to have a bunch of what's basically minor things uh, interfere with that. So, yeah, I would advise people to to have their things sorted out and have them ready to go. You know, I have uh, I have one small case where I put all the what I consider my emergency supplies. So it, it helps a lot to have that organized. I love, by the way, that Julie's editing you right now. She's producing the show as, yeah. we're, as, as we're here. That's good. <laughs> She's standing here giving me notes. Yeah. We, oh. You could do better. You're, you're like a you seven. Better, right. Yeah. <laughs> He does. he does. He's great. Yeah. So <laughs> we've been working together for 15 years, Julie and I met her 15 years ago. And uh, and we went I went from doing the radio show videos to maybe have a television show to working with her to actually having the show on PBS. So it's, it's a wonderful partnership. Well, when she brought up FOMO, uh, when you brought it up and she made sure we got it right. Uh, most of us have that when you travel, you want to see everything. And one of my favorite stories though, Joseph, in your book was the story of when you were in Carcassonne. And I don't know if you remember that one and can tell us that one, but I think that's a great illustration of be in the moment. Exactly. And that's what that story is about. I make fun of myself. I try to do that in the book. I try to do that in the show too, by the way, the, the show, I try to feature my guests like you are doing today and feature the people I'm meeting and they're the most important thing. And if I have to do something to put myself in a not perfect light, that's okay with me. So that story is about that. It's about realizing that El Dorado, which means the golden one, it's, it's taken from the poem by Edgar Allan Poe, uh, where it, the part of the poem is, you know, about searching for the, over the next hill is the perfect golden city. It's not here. It's over there. You just keep traveling and traveling in search of El Dorado. And in this story, I get a tip on a wonderful place to go. There are so many wonderful places in France. Carcassonne is in France, this castled, walled city in, in, in France. And I'm there uh, having an experience and having an, about to have another experience with these wonderful people in Minerve. 
But I've been given a tip about this place that you, I have to go. And people just keep telling me, oh, don't miss Baj. Don't miss Baj, a little seaside village where there's a wonderful restaurant. And that just hangs over me and pushes me into these ridiculous actions where I end up really messing up four different experiences and never really have the one I'm, I'm, I'm searching for. So the lesson is, of course, where, you know, uh, El Dorado is here. The moment that you're having is the one that you need to fulfill and always thinking about there's something better out there. There's something, another place I should be, which is a, a something travelers do. They create itinerary. And they say, okay, I'm here, and this is fabulously wonderful, magnificent, but I'm supposed to be over there. Or th what about this place I'm supposed to go to? And they ruin the moment they're in. And that's, that's very important not to do that. And in a humorous way, I hope I made that point. Well, you, you, you really did. You're dragging me as the reader across France, hoping to get to this one place. And, and, and I've been to Carcassonne and it is oh. gorgeous. And, yeah. and you're pretty much throwing it out the window because oh, yeah. we got to get, we got to get yep. to this. Don't miss Baj. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, and you said Baj was wonderful, but you didn't have enough time there to appreciate no. it. No, absolutely not. I went to this fabulous restaurant. I ate this wonderfully expensive meal in about two minutes. <laughs> so and I think I expressed that and in, in, in my disappointment. But I learn at the end. There you go. The payoff is the next day I did it differently. So you can always have it. You can always be better. You can always be better. Is that what's wrong with a lot of group tours that people take, Joseph? No, that is what's wrong with a lot of group tours. They don't have uh, time for people to really have an experience. And when, if you consider the fact that the most important part of every experience is your interactions with the people you meet, then how are you going to have those if you're on a uh, – if it's Tuesday, it must be Belgium type of experience. There's no way you can have that. There's no way you can stop and slow down enough where something can happen to you. And that's what I tried to promote in the book. That's what I tried to promote on Joseph Rosendo's Travel Scope television show is take the time to have that moment with people because those are the ones that you're going to remember. And, you know, the television show is, is a half hour show. We do two hours of experiences in a half an hour. So it's pretty packed and we don't have a lot of time with things, but we do try to have the set give people the sense of you have got to take time and you have to be prepared too. Uh, the show is a show that uh, tries to entertain, educate and inspire people. That's why the shows are what you're you're hopefully learning something from my shows and you're hopefully being entertained by some of the antics that things that take place. But um, you should be inspired to try to have an experience of your own, with that same kind of spirit. That's my, that's my goal. We're all afraid though, as you know, of those negative experiences and for people that haven't traveled much outside of the United States, like you have, you get into these uh, foreign cultures that you're not familiar with. And there's some fear there, which is where the group travel comes in. So is there a way to have the guardrails up just a little bit, but still immerse yourself, maybe get a little bit of the best of both worlds? Yeah, there is. There certainly is. I don't know if I've found it, but there certainly <laughs> is uh, uh, a way to travel cautiously, uh, not cautiously, but travel intelligently, travel with aware, be aware. I think the, that was what be, I would say the, the safe, what's going to make you the safest is just be aware of the situation. Be aware and be intelligent in your traveling. Don't put yourself in really foolish and dangerous situations. And most people don't do that. Most people are overly cautious, overly afraid of the other, overly afraid of making an effort because they don't know what's there. And of course, that's the that's the thrill of travel is that you don't know what's there, what's what to expect. You can plan all you want to go to a destination, you can set up, make all the arrangements you can. But the thrill is to get there and things happen to you that you didn't expect. 
you're not going to remember the, all the arrangements you made and all those plans. What you're going to remember is the thing that happened that you didn't expect to happen. That's why I love traveling in India. It, and, and I think part of the way you have those, these great experiences, you make a decision of where you're going. And, and you look for the destinations that offer you the possibilities of that. And India is one of those. It's not for everybody because it is there are some difficult things about traveling in India, uh, accommodations and making arrangements, and transportation, just the experience, the an emotional experience of being in India. I like to say that in India, in three blocks, you have 33 new things happen to you. You'll feel, smell, hear, and you know, feel 33 different things you never felt before. That's a pretty packed experience. It's not for everybody, but you can't miss India. Some places you can travel and you can be anywhere. Yeah. But India is one of those places you just walk, step outside the door, it grabs you by the throat and thrashes you around. Cheryl, my spouse has been there and said that it assaults your senses. Very yeah, beautiful <laughs> description. Yeah. But she absolutely loved it. To your point, absolutely loved it. How, how important is it to know some of the language when you go to these places? You have to know some of the language. And when I say some of the language, you need to know bonjour in France. <laughs> you need to be able to say uh, hola in Spain or in Spanish-speaking country. You need to be able to say thank you. You need to say please. The more you know, and don't be afraid of the fact that you may not say it right. The more you know, uh, the better. But at least, please, thank you. All the niceties, pardon me, you know, all the stuff you need to say, how much, <laughs> combien in French, how much, is very important. And it's very important because people want to see that you're trying. People are interested in you if you're interested in them. Mm. So if you're interested in their culture, they're going to be inter open to you. They're going to help you. They're going to talk to you. They're going to try their English out on you then. But you need to open the door. You can't do what many Americans do, people, you know, many ugly travelers, not ugly Americans, it's any nationality, go to a country and expect people to be able to cater to you. Uh, you expect people to speak your language. Unfortunately, I heard things in restaurants from my fellow Americans that I really are really sad, where they say things like, oh, he speaks English, he's just pretending. Well, even if he does know English, it's not his obligation to speak to you in your language. <laughs> right. You're in a foreign country. It's your obligation to make an effort. And just making an effort opens up doors. And so, yeah, uh, a little bit, a little bit. Uh, every good phrase book, I, when I, as phrase book is a guidebook, I normally take a Lonely Planet and Rough Guides with me. In the back, they have a glossary of terms. They have phrases that you might need. Any good phrase book has good morning, uh, good day. How can I, uh, can I have a glass of water? I mean, and people see you struggling with that. It's charming. Some people may, they may, may not want to wait for you. They may be impatient, but the fact that you're sitting there charming and you're trying to figure out their language means a lot to people. Think about what it means to you. Absolutely. To somebody come up to you and try to try to speak English and try to reach out to you. It means a lot. I'm assuming that I don't want to put words into your mouth. The way you create some of these spontaneous interactions that you're going to remember comes from, you mentioned curiosity, then asking questions, asking questions about what are you doing? What's this taste like? What's this thing? I would imagine when you travel, Joseph, you must ask a ton of questions. I do. But this idea of being aware that we talked about earlier about saving, how you keep yourself a little bit safer, how you keep yourself safe is by being aware. Being aware and listening and watching will also be the a way in to have these interactions I'm talking about. In uh, We were in uh, Armenia and where I was walking, I was in a market. I love markets, by the way, because markets are where people go. And if you want an interaction with people, you have them there. And they're, they are interested in talking to you because they're selling you something. So you get an entry right there to them. And I was walking by and I saw a bunch of guys in a, a place that was selling rugs and they were having a little lunch. So I kind of just walked in and I just said, what is that? You know, I asked them, somebody came over to help me. They saw I was struggling, but I said hello to them in their language. And then I asked, what were they eating? And 
They didn't know, but they brought somebody over who could speak some Eng- a woman who could speak some English with me. She told me what it was, and they started cutting it and offering it to me. Then, of course, um, I was very appreciative of that. They saw that. And then next thing you know, they're pouring out their little schnapps and uh, I'm drinking that. And my camera guy was with me and we walked right on in and he shot this whole scene of me interacting with him. It's one of the, the sweetest, the warmest and the most revealing of the Armenian character uh, that I have in the show. And it was something I just saw something that was of interest and curiosity, of course, every, as a traveler. Everything must be of interest to you. Everything and everybody must be of interest because you don't know where El Dorado lies. You don't know where the gold is. And you're wandering in a foreign land, which is the whole, keep coming back to that story, uh, that we're wandering in a foreign land looking for the gold. Uh, Pico Ayer, the great travel writer, calls it the significant moment. You're looking for that significant moment. You can travel for days and days and days. And every trip we would say, where's that travel scope moment? Where's that travel scope moment? Let's go here. Maybe it's here. Let's go here. And then you have to put yourself out. This is where people have problems. You're talking about fear and how do you protect yourself? People have trouble opening them out and open themselves up in a foreign country because they think they're making themselves vulnerable. Sure. Sometimes you may be making yourself vulnerable. You got to be aware. Uh, you know, there are not always nice people in the world. But still, if you're going to be a traveler, you got to take risks. And it's just what's your level of risk tolerance depends on where you go. But, uh, you know, people travel in Europe, they think it's easy. I was ripped off in Europe. So, you know, and I traveled all throughout India and didn't have any problems. So how do you know? Well, and I don't have time for you to tell this story, but the, you, you tell a story musings uh, that I think people will love about you in Alexandria. You got ripped off in Alexandria. However, I love the end of the story, which was, okay, I got ripped off for X amount of money, but I had wonderful tea with new people I met. I had a great dinner. I shared all these stories. And then in the end, I ended up paying for it, maybe a little more than I should have. But it sounded like the end of that story was in the balance. You still won. There was still a. That's exactly. You got it. That is indeed it. And uh, I gambled on a human being and I lost. But sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But it was certainly worth it. It was worth it. I want to ask you one more question because you mentioned Armenia and India. And in some of these cultures, you know, for a lot of people listening to this who are most of our audience is American, not all of them. I think we're in 47 different countries. But for the Americans, especially, you know, Joseph, bargaining on a daily basis is not part of our culture and we're not used to it. And I know one of your musings, you write a little bit about bargaining, and I thought maybe you could help us today with that. When when's the appropriate time to bargain? What types of things should we bargain on and maybe not bargain on? And there's got to be some clues and some best practices when it comes to bargaining. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, my background is Cuban. My family, I, so I come from a Latin culture where bargaining is a very much a, a part of that experience when you're buying and selling. Uh, so I've had a lot of experience and I had much as a kid. I grew up with a dad who was like that, selling and buying things. So um the time to bargain, there, there are certain places in the world where it's almost de rigueur. You should bargain. If you don't bargain, you're just a stupid tourist. And you don't want to be a stupid tourist. You want to be a part of the culture. You want to know how the culture works. Many of the Latin cultures are open to that. A lot of the Asian cultures, too, open to that. But there are many different markets, many different. Uh, the, the more casual the selling uh, arrangement is, the more possibility that you can negotiate. But you got you know, you have to watch what's going on. You know, you're not going to negotiate in a shop in Paris unless you buy a lot of stuff. <laughs> really expensive. But you can bargain with people and, and you should. I feel you should. And you have to always keep in mind that you don't want to take advantage of anybody. So you need to know what you're bargaining for and how much the value of what you're bargaining for is to those people. I'll make an offer to them. It becomes part of the interaction. And like any interaction in any country or even ours, if you do it in good spirit, And you do it with a desire to get to know somebody along the way here and to learn something about somebody, then you can do that without having to 
cause any problems. You're, you're not going to insult anybody. You're not going to be arrogant to somebody. You're not going to act like people uh, working are working for you. You're going to honor what they do. You're going to be engaged in a conversation and an experience with them. You're going to let them know a little bit about yourself, and they're going to let you know about a little bit about them. Bargaining becomes a tool to get to know the people in a destination and to get to have those wonderful moments. I've had some, some of the most hilarious, some of the most the fun ones I've had, some of the most interesting ones uh, I've had uh, have been in markets and where I was bargaining with people. You never take advantage of people. Everybody has to win. That's what you go in with that idea. This is a win, 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 win situation. They have to get what they feel is fair, and you have to get what you feel is fair. And you are making a statement in certain cultures by saying, no, you're going to have to treat me like one of the guys. <laughs> you're going to have to treat me like one of you. I'm not just somebody you can put in a little pigeonhole and say, oh, there's another tourist yeah. that I can sell something to. No, you're going to have to. You're going to have to give me more than that for my money. Well, so and what's your first bid then? Is your first bid the minimum? When you say don't take advantage of people, then I, I, I'm i assuming this being a, a money show, ostensibly, that we start off with um, minimum, minimum viable amount where I think it, it works for both of us. Uh, no, <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> uh, kind of embarrass people sometimes. No, I come in with an uh, offer that's a little bit ridiculous. Okay. Because I want the guy to go, oh, come on. You can't. No. Uh, no. You know, come on. How can I give it to you for that? So then I can go, oh, well, okay. I just thought, you know, that's what I have in my pocket. Yeah. So now I'm, we're having a little repartee. So then he'll come in with a different offer. And then I'll go, I'll, I'll normally get much closer. Once I get an idea of where he's at, once I've pushed him way over here, then I have a better idea of what the product costs. You First said it. All. Yeah. You said in the book that you could, something I found really interesting. You can tell often by that first volley back, how much they come down really right. where the ballpark's really going to be. Oh, so some cultures you have to 50% yeah. of whatever they're asking, you know, $10, I'll give you five. Wow. No, I know. Hey, and then maybe he'll sell it for six or seven, which is probably what it's worth. And he's happy and you're happy. You'll find a spot once you get that initial, once you kind of get a sense of what is true here, what's real here, then for, for people that matter, what's real for people? You want to be somebody who matters. You don't want to be somebody who just blows through there and, oh, yeah, I've got my, you know, I'm just buying. Uh, oh, oh so, it's all so cheap here. You know, I can yeah. just spend my money any way I want. And none of this means anything to me. No, I want to. I want to show him that this, no, my money means something to me, just like yours does. So let's find a place where we can agree. Some people aren't comfortable with that. I think it's an entree to have an experience with people and to get to know them and, and to share who you are. Those are some of my fondest memories or some of the bartering I've done. As, as, as painful as it's been for me, <laughs> it just, it, it is some fun memories. Yeah. And, and, and I always feel like afterwards that we're buddies. Somehow we are yeah, now friends. Exactly. That's, that's what, that's what you've got to be aware of. You can't be worried so much about getting the, the greatest deal in the world that you're going to make an enemy. You don't want that. You the, want to make sure everybody's happy. The book is Musings, The Short Happy Pursuit of Pleasure and Other Journeys. It's such a fun collection. I had a blast with it, Joseph. Available, I think, everywhere, but at Travelscope.net. It's available on Amazon as a uh, paperback and uh, also uh, some other places uh, as a paperback through uh, Ingram Sparks. But it's uh, it's also digital and on Amazon and in iBooks. You can get it digitally in iBooks and Amazon. Yeah. Last question. When you're making series next up for you guys would be season 13. Do you skip 13? I mean, 2020 was kind of a 13 year. Do you just go to season yeah. 14? I could for sure. I think that's a good idea. I like that. I like that. Best way for people to kind of follow what we're doing, by the way, is to go to travelscope.net, our website, and they can keep, uh, we pretty much let them know everything we're up to. Yeah, we're trying to get 12 done. So we'll, 12 has been 13, or like you said, 2020 <laughs> was the best 13 ever. Bad luck for sure. But we're going to get it done. We're going to get season 12 done, and then we'll see what's left for us. Awesome. Thank you so much for hanging out and talking travel with us for a little bit, Joseph. I really appreciate it. Joe, it was fabulous. Thank you very much. And anytime you want to have me back, I'm available. 
Hey, trivia hacks. I'm your pal, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And doesn't listening to Joseph make you want to get back out there and start traveling again? You know, we could go to Bavaria or maybe the Canadian Rockies or, or even Southeast Asia. I was just going over my reward point program to cash in on some of these things. But I love rewards, and if you don't use them, you should start. Here's why. If you just get a card with a low, low $299 annual fee, and then you pay like 50 bucks per 100 points you spend, you get to fly totally free. Oh my God, such a roller coaster of emotions I have right now, just thinking about getting back out in the wild. Speaking of roller coasters, hey, L.A. Thompson created the first one on this date back in 1885, maybe a year or two before Joe was born, but not too long ago, the longest, tallest, and fastest wooden roller coaster in Texas was opened. What park was it opened in? I'll be back with your answer faster than you can get motion sickness from watching Joe's mom with a can opener. <laughs> oh my God, that's funny. Managing your money has typically been complicated, time-consuming, and just another reason to bite your nails. But for half a million investors who have accounts with M1 Finance, investing is smarter, more automated, and easier than ever. Do yourself a favor this year and check out M1. This finance super app is designed to be personalized for your needs. Their automation tools make it simpler to reach your financial goals. With M1, you can invest how you want with access to fractional shares and unmatched automation all for free. You can borrow against your investments at super low rates, just two to three and a half percent, and use this flexible portfolio line of credit for anything like investing more in your portfolio, refinancing other loans, or funding large projects. M1 ties it together in a free digital account so you can have more flexibility and smoother money moments and movements. I like money moments though, myself. That's, that's just me but it says here money movements. Just keep in mind, borrowing involves higher risk, of course, and rates may vary. Visit m1finance.com. That's m, the number one finance.com forward slash SB. Make sure you put the SB on there because when you sign up, you get $30 to invest because you're a stacker. Again, that's visit m1finance.com slash SB to sign up and get $30 to invest. Terms and conditions apply. Hey, trivia fans, it's your pal, again, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And I just checked into my rewards point program, and uh, so, he, wow, I've accumulated all these great rewards by paying for everything on my credit card. The good news is that even though there's a 23% interest rate, I get to travel for free. I can't believe what I'm reading. In fact, I just booked a trip back to visit my alma mater, Southwest Bahama State Beauty School and Technical Institute, of course, duh. And do you know that for the low cost of $853 between the rewards fee and interest on the card and, you know, fees to use my points like everybody has to do, I'm traveling, get this totally, totally free. Oh man, the life I have woven for myself. Hey, let's get you to today's trivia answer, shall we? The question was this one. In tribute to the roller coaster being invented by L.A. Thompson on this date in 1885, not too long ago, the longest, tallest, fastest wooden roller coaster in Texas was opened. What park was it opened in? If you guessed Six Flags over Joe's mom's house, that's not a thing. But if you said SeaWorld San Antonio, then you'd be right. I mean, because what else do you think about when you think SeaWorld but roller coasters? Buckle up, folks. This coaster includes a 100-foot screamer of a drop. And even though Sammy Hagar can't drive 55, this machine reaches a top speed of 55 MPH. Maybe I'll spend my free reward points on that trip next. What do you think? See ya. Big thanks to Joseph for joining us. Don't be a sightseer, OG. Get in the culture. Get your hands dirty. Go meet the people. So I'm not allowed to get off the airplane, get in a taxi, go to my hotel and sit on the beach? You can, yes. I do remember when we were in uh, Italy. Did I tell you we went to Italy? 
It's been a while, but tell me again. And I, well, I was surprised because we were in this tour group and we would have these, uh, these off days, these off times. And our tour guide would do exactly what Joseph said, which is use that free time to go envelop yourself in, in things. So you're not just, oh, it's, what was his line? Oh, it's Wednesday. We must be in Belgium, right? <laughs> Instead of having that, it's Wednesday. We must be <laughs> jump into the culture, and uh, our tour guides were great, and they and they told Cheryl and my daughter Autumn and I where to go. We went down to the Jewish Quarter one day in Rome, learned some of the history. Just the three of us ate in this place where nobody spoke English, and they were so nice to us. It was it was I don't know. You felt like you were just enveloped enveloped in it. And that's, you know, one of 50, 50 million stories. I know Doug was teasing me about Bavaria and Southeast Asia, which is why I had to flex with Italy instead. But uh, big thanks to Joseph for joining us. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline OG and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends down at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first for me right now, the things that I value the most are finally putting away all of the Christmas decorations. <laughs> were we supposed to do that already? I thought you were going to say if somebody else put away the decorations, overseeing other people putting away the decorations. Well, yeah, <laughs> let me be clear. I'm not actually putting them away. I have a strategy about this OG, and it was more important when I was in Michigan than it is now that I'm back in Texas, but I still think it's a valid thing. I think winter is still a little drab. Why don't we leave those lights up all winter long? Like we should totally leave the lights up and make it festive all winter long. Why do we take them down January 1st or in your case, almost February 1st? <laughs> there is kind of that sense though, right? Like in November, you get the stuff out, you start getting stuff out and you're decorating. And then like the first part of January, you're like, put all this crap away. It's Christmas is over. It's time to get back to reality, everyone. Yeah, no. See, I don't like that. No, not a fan. I think it should be winter lights. Don't get me wrong. You can put away the holiday specific stuff, but like the lights on the house, the lights on the trees. That are designed like a candy cane. <laughs> with Santa Claus on the rooftop and that sort of thing. You can take down that stuff, but keep the keep just the festive lights up all winter long. I don't know. Just my uh, my two cents there. What I'd like to see, folks, let's make it happen. They actually say it's your loved ones in your time, but how much better during the winter is your loved ones in your time when you've got the decorations up? That's why they made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. They have streamlined the application process so you get an instant coverage decision. It doesn't take nearly as long as the essay that you'll find with some companies. Prices are affordable. And of course, we talked about how you want to make sure the company's been around and they will pay. Mass Mutual, been around more than 160 years, OG. A lot of birthday candles on that cake. <laughs> that's, a, that's a liability claim right there. Blowing that thing out. Today, we're going to throw out the lifeline to Steve. Say hi, Steve. Joe, this is Steve the Mailman. I've been listening to your show for a while now and was finally motivated by you to do something this year. Let me tell you, Ted Lasso was awesome. Thanks for the suggestion. Oh, and I also opened a brokerage account outside of my 401k. I make regular contributions, but not automatically. I buy individual stocks, and I'm making a killing because of my natural genius. Thanks for all the great advice. <laughs> Oops, I almost forgot. Did I mention that I'm using Robin Hood? Later, dude. Nice. Nice. Way to pour salt in that wound, Steve. Good job. Everything Steve learned, self-destructive, which I think, I think what Steve's really saying, by the way, congratulations, Steve, if you're doing uh, a few things, I, I won't even address the using a responsible brokerage piece, but automatic contributions, OG, into an account that's flexible after, after you've got that retirement plan going the way you want it. Put money in the retirement plan first. I think that's a recipe for success. I agree. Yeah. I mean, if he's uh, getting, if he's a really a mailman, probably has a pension. If he's been doing it a long time, uh, has access to the TSP. So he's access to a 401k plan, which is, uh, that's the government version of that. And uh, there's money beyond that. And you're taking full advantage of that, at least up to the match. 
preferably maxing that out. That's almost 20,000 you can put in this year if you're under 50 and 25, 26,000 if you're over. So uh, if you check all those boxes and there's still money, might consider a Roth, non-deductible IRA contribution, but a regular brokerage account is a great place. Switch to automatic though. And uh, unless you want another full-time job, I'd stay away from the individual stocks. Not that you can't have fun with those. I mean, if it's play money, have some fun with individual stocks. But if you're using it to reach your goal, I'd stick with mutual funds and index funds, OG. Yep. Nice job. And by the way, Steve, you didn't give us your email. So email us, uh, joe at stackybedjamins.com or gertrude at stackybedjamins.com. And we'll have mom's friend Gertrude, the room mother in our basement Facebook group and uh, community manager. She will uh, send you out a code so that you can have a Haven Life Greatest Money Show on Earth t-shirt for calling in. We love doing that. And if you want to also call and brag about all the great stuff you did like Steve did, Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. Or if you've got a question for OG and I, we're happy to take it. That's going to do it for today. Big thanks to Joseph Rosendo. I know that Doug's going to thank him, but I always uh, really love these travel shows and the history shows that we do. I think uh, for me, man, it's really fun diving into some of this stuff. Learning, as Joseph says, about different cultures and different times, and different people think really does a lot to inform where we are today. Speaking of today, if you're not in the best place that you think you should be after what was a horrible year, well, don't you deserve to have a friend in your corner who can help you do better? OG and his team are taking clients now. So if you need better help to get toward your goals, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash OG. That's linked to his team's calendar and uh, you can do better with your money in 2021. All right, that's going to do it for today. Doug, where do we go from here, man? So what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our headlines. While Roths are taking the cake for the fastest growing retirement vehicle, make sure not to forget about your other options like the HSA and your pre-tax 401k, especially if there's a match on your 401k. Second, take a lesson from Joseph Rosendo. To get the most out of your travel experience, don't be a sightseer. The most fun is to interact with the people and culture. But the big lesson? Dive into reward points. I just found out that if I open 10 cards and they each have an $85 annual fee, I'll never pay to travel again. At least not this year. You know, then they're always talking about these terms and conditions apply and I guess I'm going to have to create a spreadsheet to make sure I cancel my cards at the right time. But, but you know, it's all passive. See ya. Thanks to Joseph Rosendo for joining us. You'll find Joseph Rosendo's new book, Musings, wherever books are sold. This show is created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Taylor Stevens, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, Visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and if you could only know what it really smells like down here. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. After show time. Rules about after show if you're new. Number one, 
it doesn't exist. It's like Fight Club. If you don't know what Fight Club is, that's why you don't know what Fight Club is. Get it? Because it doesn't exist. So here's the deal. Don't talk about it. If you got to talk about what we call dessert. Not my finest hour. We were talking about um, putting a speaker near the tree. So when the kid comes out and flicks the bark off, I can like yell into it like, you're killing me. This hurts. You're just getting me alive. You know, maybe you would stop doing it. Uh, now my finest hour, when I was in high school, it reminded me of uh, a friend of mine that I knew. I was a little bit of a troublemaker. And by loose proximity, uh, I happened to be in the same vehicle with this kid. He had equipped his Oldsmobile. Yes, it was his father's Oldsmobile with an external speaker CB radio. Really? Because obviously, you know, you're 17 and... That's dangerous. Yeah. So <clears throat> what uh, one of his friends had figured out, they had found a bird on the side of the road that was no longer with us. It was sleeping, sleeping on the side of the road. It, had, it was taking a dirt nap. We always talk about that, by the way, when we see uh, dead animals on the side of the road, we were running. We're like, what a horrible place to take a nap. Shh. The bunny is sleeping. Shh. That's funny. I'm actually going to do that next time. So anyways, we see this sleeping bird and in their infinite wisdom, they decide that it would be a great idea to tie the bird to the antenna of the car. Oh Lord. Because at the exact speed, it actually looks like the bird is flying (laughs) and keeping up with the vehicle. (laughs) But when you're not driving, it looks like a bird that's just hanging there off the antenna. (laughs) So we pull up next to this. Uh, We're at the stoplight. I want somebody to do that with me when I die, by the way. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Just take my body. Just strap you to a vehicle. Hook me up like Aunt Edna to the Griswold vehicle and fly me one last time. So like, like, what are we doing? We're taking Uncle Joe out for one last flight. One last spin. Uh, So we're at the stoplight. Pull up uh, an old lady in a hair bonnet pulls up next to us. And it's springtime, so the windows are down. And she looks over and sees this little bird hanging from the antenna. And my friend Matt, and if you're listening, you know who you are. My friend Matt grabs the microphone and goes, tweet, tweet. I'm sure she thought it was ever but as hilarious as you did. She started driving through the red light. <laughs> yes. She's like, I'm out of here. <laughs> No, thank you. I will pass. Not my finest hour. We were helping my Aunt Joyce move uh, from Kalamazoo to LaPorte, Indiana. And that's a long drive. And uh, down the highway, we had this old truck with a engine. I think it was a six cylinder, but I think two and a half of the cylinders actually worked. So it, it, it would, oh, oh, it was just horrible. And it, and of course, you know, the muffler system was horrible. So it made all kinds of noise, but anyway, we thought it was really fun when we're driving bunches of her stuff down the turnpike to go up next to a car and get next to it, hang out next to it, have the windows open. We have our arms out the window. And then I would, under my breath, go three, two, one. And he and I would start flapping our arms as hard as we could while I floored it. And we'd slowly, <laughs> slowly, with the with the muffler sound, the burr, 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 you'd see us like pulling the car ahead of them. So dumb. But we were maybe the two people on earth that thought that was hilarious. It's dumb stuff you do in cars when you're a kid. Don't do it. Yeah. Folks. But, but seriously, after I die, OG, just take me out for a flight. Come up next to a car, by the way, and I'm just dangling from the thing and go, tweet, tweet, 